Thanks to her wit, audacity and incredible self-confidence, the legendary Mrs. Astor, one of the most prominent figures in the Gilded Age, made it to the top of New York's high society. She was almost invincible in her reign in American aristocracy until she faced an unexpected strike from inside her own family. Most curiously, this story doesn't end with scandal. This family food morphed into something entirely unexpected. This bitter drama turned into a name that's synonymous with luxury, elegance and sophistication worldwide. In this video, we are going to dive deep into the scandalous world of high society, family secrets and a transformation that turned a family scandal into a billion-dollar empire, the magnificent hotel chain, the Waldorf Astoria. When we hear or mention the name of Mrs. Astor, we do not have to make any additional introduction. Indeed, there is one and only Mrs. Astor who made it to history as the uncrowned queen of the crème de la crème of New York society at the turn of the 20th century. You may learn more about this side of her life in my dedicated video. However, during her lifetime there was quite some discussion about her unblushing appropriation of this almost noble title. There was another Mrs. Astor on stage who had her own rightful claims for this name and why not fame after all. Let's find out how this all happened. In the mid-19th century, there were two brothers who set the pace for the real estate development in Manhattan. John Jacob Astor III was the eldest son of William Backhouse Astor Sr., who in turn inherited the fortune of his father John Jacob Astor, the Sam illiterate butcher's son who came to America from Germany and made money on fur trade and smuggling opium into China, and then investing it into the fast-developing land in and outside New York City. The guy was so successful in his now highly doubtful business that the fortune he built has been fueling the well-being and the inviolable social class reputation for generations of his descendants. Now let's get back to the third the generation of Astor moguls, the two brothers. So John Jacob Astor III was the eldest son and William Backhouse Astor Jr., the second um, middle son in the family, being seven years younger than John Jacob. Both sons continued enjoying the fruits of real estate investments of their predecessors, yet at the end of the day followed a totally different path. The elder John Jacob III married a pious Charlotte Augusta Gibbs, and the middle William Backhouse Jr. tied the knot with the highly ambitious socialite Caroline Lena Webster Scammerhorn who would never settle for anything other than the exceptional. Do you already feel what would light that spark of a family food? Exactly! Two brothers, two Astors, hence two Mrs. Astor. Uh-uh, this didn't suit Lena, so although she was technically the younger Mrs. Astor, hence officially her title was Mrs. William Astor, she made the society learn by heart that she is the Mrs. Astor and the only lady of this family worthy of an almost noble title with this the in front of her name. Well, lucky Lena, the wife of the elder Astor, couldn't care less of this breach of social hierarchy. She was a deeply religious person, involved in her charity activities, helping children and women in difficult situations seating on the board of the women's hospital and sponsoring the erection of the first wing of New York uh, Cancer Hospital. However, 28 years of living in houses one next to another, basically sharing the same plot of land at Fifth Avenue, did their job and tension between the two so different ladies 
grew to the level of disdain. Alas, Charlotte died in 1887, and this flame didn't have a chance to turn into a serious fire. Well, her successors had different plans. Following his beloved wife, the elder Esther brother died three years later in 1890. His only son, William Waldorf Esther, inherited his part of the Esther fortune, the Fifth Avenue house including. He was quite an ambitious man with his own plans for this life, other than being the god of the New York property. So, having become the nominal head of the larger family and the second richest man in America, he tried to turn everything the way he saw it. His wife, Mary Mamie Dahlgren Paul, should be now known as the new Mrs. Astor, and his aunt, that old Lena, the society queen, should know her place and watch her leap from now on. <laughs> you wish, uh, thought the old Mrs. Astor, and pulled every string to almost ban the young Mrs. Astor from proper acknowledgement in her new role. To tell the truth, that wasn't too big of an effort. Mamie was 18 years younger and gravitated to zero on the scale of social weight. Well, William Waldorf decided not to tilt at the windmills and came up with a plan of elegant revenge that indeed would better be served cold. He didn't engage in brutal social fights feeding the beast of the scandal-hungry crowd. He simply raised his father's brownstone mansion to the ground and built a 13-story high building of Waldorf Hotel right next to the teeny-tiny neighboring house of his nasty aunt. Not only did it dwarf her mansion and cast her garden into shade, but it gave her a view of a sky-blocking brick wall. Like, all right, you are the Mrs. Astor, let's now see how you're gonna entertain your high-caliber guests right in the yard of commercial building. Oh, that was brutal. Imagine how upset was the Mrs. Astor, who was a conservative to the backbone. She loved her old-fashioned brownstone Fifth Avenue mansion and couldn't believe that such a strike to what she loved most would come from inside her family. Oh, and the first Waldorf Hotel was a splendor. Built so huge on purpose to completely overshadow Mrs. Astor's pathetic house, it resembled the German Renaissance castle, all electric, heavily furnished with the finest antique furniture from Europe, it had 450 guest rooms, further 100 rooms allocated to servants. Well, in other words, it totally corresponded with the vibrant spirit of the Gilded Age, marking New York's fast development toward the future. Well, Mrs. Astor was destined to become the living witness of her epoch shrinking under the pressure of surrounding colossus. A small caveat here. As it happens with everything new and disrupting, it often feels rather disturbing for those used to the old ways. The same happened at first to the Waldorf Hotel. New York society and tourists mocked the hotel for its large number of bathrooms. Could you imagine that? They hated its size, the way how expensive it was, how it ruined the otherwise good old neighborhood. Well, everything went against the hair. I think this wave of hate was fueled by no one else than Lena herself. Alas, she was on the wrong side of the history here. With the joint efforts of the new money city elite, led by her rival nemesis Alva Vanderbilt, the world of hotel quite soon became the most fashionable spot in the town, a must-stay for foreign dignitaries, bringing millions of dollars of revenue to William Waldorf Astor.
Well, Lena Astor wouldn't become THE Mrs. Astor if she wasn't a tough nut herself. She spent three years watching in despair the new hotel growing next to her. Then another three years or something grieving and trying to somehow re-establish the old way of living no matter what. To then, finally, listening to the sound advice of her own son, John Jacob Astor IV, and moving further north of Fifth Avenue to the new opulent mansion and building her own hotel on the place of her former house. And that's how the fabulous Astoria Hotel was born in 1897. Of course, it had to be higher and larger than the adjacent Waldorf Hotel. Her nephew shouldn't forget who was the most powerful woman in their family. She hired the same architect, Henry Janway Hardenbeck, who built the Waldorf, chose the same romantic interpretation of the German Renaissance, but added one floor up and had 100 guest rooms more than their neighbors. And of course, she wouldn't be Mrs. Astor if she didn't include the ballroom that would feed 700 guests seated or 1,200 guests in a concert format. The same style was chosen for a reason. Despite ongoing food, both wings of the Astors never lost their business acumen. Think of it, the Astoria Hotel was constructed with connecting corridors to the adjacent Waldorf. This way, the two hotels sort of became a single establishment with 1,300 guest rooms, which made it the largest hotel in the world at the epoch bigger than any royal palace in Europe. They say, however, that a special provision was made in the contract that allowed corridors to be sealed off if the truce collapsed. How come the two hotels belonging to the rival sides of one family could still work perfectly as one solid organism? Perhaps the thing is, William Waldorf Astor never visited the Waldorf Hotel. Like, at all. Alright, it is known that he came there just once since he left the States for England, where he permanently settled and later even became a titled nobleman, the first Viscount Astor. So each time he visited America, he never stayed in his own hotel. Private life remains private life, but business is business. This way, even when Waldorf Astoria Hotel was living through its most illustrious epoch, both sides of the Astor family were heavily investing in building new, rivaling hotels that would sustain the growth of the empire in the future. So, by the time the Waldorf Astoria went out of fashion in the 1920s, its closure didn't cause any significant troubles to the Astor family business. There was no Mrs. Astor, nor her industrious nephew William Waldorf, nor her bright son John Jacob IV alive when in 1921 the inaugural Waldorf Astoria Hotel on Fifth Avenue was demolished giving place for the future Empire State Building. But unlike many landmarks of the Gilded Age New York that are now gone with the wind, you can still visit the World of Astoria Hotel now on Park Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. The successor of that first World of Astoria opened in 1931. However, all the other 30-something World of Astoria hotels across the world have never belonged to the Astors since they sold the brand to another hotel giant, Hilton, already in the 1940s. Thank you for watching this bonus episode, an extension to the playlist dedicated to the people and events that made New York's Gilded Age gilded. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons if you enjoyed it, and see you in my other videos. Bye!